The career of LA producer and engineer Mark Lynette spans everything from live mixing for Frank Zappa to engineering for Randy Newman and the Red Hot Chili Peppers. We talked to him about his studio, the gear of past and present, and his extensive work remixing and remastering classic Beach Boys records. The studio has been here for, I think, about 15, 20 years. When I, I when we bought this house, it was with having a, a room, uh, a studio for me in mind. For a long time, uh, it was just you know one one band after another and one mix after another. I've been trying to remember what year uh, we first started using Pro Tools. I do know that initially it was still just using it like a tape recorder with some plugins, but still still mixing everything through the analog console and mixing to tape. And uh, then, you know, slowly it became, less, well, not tape at all. Uh, it, never, it never went back to tape recording. Uh, the tape machines I, I still have are really, just, are really just for transfer projects, specifically, especially the Beach Boys. We have over the years transferred pretty much the, the entire Beach Boy catalog, uh, so we have easy access to it. So now the old control room uh, actually has a D command console uh, in it, which I use for mixing. And um, I, have a, I have another small system um, uh, at my home, uh, just a desktop, laptop, you know, UAD box. Um, these little, I don't have a set here, these little iLoud uh, monitors that I've become incredibly fond of. Uh, it, it's, it's scary how, how, how hi fi they are for you know, 300 bucks. And like it or hate it, uh, you can do amazing work, you know, with, with very inexpensively and with, with a very small amount of equipment. And it's a shame in a way. I mean, it's a, you know, this, this console served me well for, for a long, long time. And, uh, but it, you know, it was an incredible amount of money um, invested because that's, you know, I mean, I, I, I had these input modules made because the original ones weren't, weren't sufficient. They only, you know, in terms of EchoSense. So we built these and they have 12 EchoSense, which is kind of over, a little bit overkill. But, uh, you know, kind of what you, you, know, you need, you needed eight or, you know, for all the various outboard gears and this three stereo buses and, you know, insert points and all. <laughs> I mean, you know, the kind of thing you, you can do uh, with a piece of software instantly. And then, of course, all the, the myriad of outboard gear that we used to, <laughs> to run and patch, you know. Yeah, we still I still have a lot of um, older equipment. Uh, not as much as I used to have, because frankly, I've, I've always been a collector. So, having the studio was great in that regard. That I could I could uh, do half half and half recording studio and museum, um, although I wanted it all to work. Um, so, and one of my big because of the Beach Boy connection, one of you know one of my faves is always the uh, Universal Audio um, stuff. So uh, you know we have we have some of their original 610 um, console modules. Um, I used to have a couple of. Of, uh, of their of their actual consoles um, that I would use and and their outboard gear 175 176 compressors um, and then a lot of the you know a lot of the standard stuff I mean Pultex and Uri 1176s RCAs and uh, you know limiters and uh, Neve limiters and um, and of course all the all the reverbs I, I for for quite a while I was sort of collecting. Uh, Spring reverbs, and uh, we've got a we've got a stereo EMT plate in the back that came out of uh, Studio Fifty Five, which was the old Decca Studios here in Los Angeles. I was in when you know uh, uh, when when old gear became good again. Um, you know, all this probably most everybody knows that all this old gear was considered worthless and um, um, <laughs> less than desirable. For a very long time, I mean, uh, you know, tales of, of uh, you know, Pultex being sold at junk stores for fifteen dollars, you know. Um, so I got in a little, you know, pretty early. Um, so I was able to buy, you know, forty brand new, you know, not brand new, but you know, pristine forty sevens for five hundred dollars and things like that. Um, before this, everything went completely crazy um, <laughs> in terms of what uh, what what you had to pay. It's interesting about, about, about the old gear that we all, myself included, revere so much. Lee Hirschberg was, uh, he was a staff engineer at, at Western and um, most significantly did all of Frank Sinatra's recordings uh, starting uh, with the Strangers of the Night album. And um, 
he was here one time, and at that point, I, I had one of the original consoles from Western Studios, and I thought, you know, he would find it nostalgic to see the thing. And I showed it to him, and he was actually almost horrified, you know, that anybody would want to use the darn thing. Um, I realized, or he explained, or, you know, we talked about it, and it was because the, the unreliability was just, you know, paramount. I mean, you can imagine, because, you know, especially the tube stuff, it's just so finicky, and I, I could just imagine <laughs> having doing a Frank Sinatra session with forty guys and the chairman, you know, in the studio, and the console starts, you know, starts to fry, and you've got to be the one to say, you know, we need to take a break, you know. So I, I finally, because I've always wondered. I mean, the tube stuff always seems to sound better in the old recordings. Um, I'm not sure if the solid, if it's because the solid state consoles, when they went to them, weren't so good at the beginning. Um, it was also the period when multi-track recording, be, you know, it changed from capturing a performance in a room to well, let's slice and dice everything, and you know, cut a basic track, and everything be isolated, and you know, so that that that's certainly part of it. But but clearly, the from the engineering point of view, the reliability outweighed everything else. And uh, this is why, I mean, when I started in the 70s, if you went to the crummiest studio in town, that's where you'd find the, I mean, I'm the 47s. I remember I worked at a really crummy studio in the 70s and they had a Telefunken 251. That was the, the that, you know, they had, I, I don't think we used it that much because the 87 was, you know, more modern. But that's where that stuff wound up because nobody else wanted it, you know. And uh, we've all probably heard, you know, stories of, you know, six seventies getting thrown in the trash. I mean, I heard stories about that when you know Western had had mastering rooms for years. All everybody had some kind of mastering room because that's how you took something home, even if it wasn't, you know, for actually cutting a, a, a master disc. You had something to cut refs with. Uh, but what Western, of course, had real mastering rooms, and when they uh, um, decommissioned those, I've told I'm told that the six seventies, which were used for cutting, went in the shop. And at some point, it were used for doorstops, literally. And when people got tired of tripping over them, out to the dumpster they went. You know, now you pay $70,000 for one. You know, I mean, it's you know, crazy. I wound up working with, with Brian and the Beach Boys just from one phone call. Uh, I just happened to call uh, uh, Ocean Way uh, recording out here one day. I, I, my recollection is I must have been looking to book time for one of my projects, and the lady that ran the studio said that they had a you know, last-minute session for Brian Wilson. They didn't have an, you know, he doesn't have his own engineer. Do you, you know, they want us to get him an engineer? I said sure. I had worked with Carl a little bit. Ironically, I had engineered um, David Lee Roth's uh, uh, part of uh, when he did California Girls. I did the background session, which Carl sang on along with Christopher Cross and maybe Tom Kelly. I can't really remember. God, I've done I did a couple of sessions that Carl was on, some for America, who I'd done a lot of albums for. Um, but I never worked with Brian. Um, so I showed up for the, for the session and wound up spending a year working on his album. That album went on for a long time. And um, this is right when CD reissues were starting to happen. So when the decision was made to uh, put Pet Sounds out, I was given that job. And um, you know, then we did the Tufers, and then we did the Good Vibrations box, and on and on and on. Um, and I, can't, I, didn't, I didn't do much work for Brian after the first album until uh, about 2000, uh, when we did Live at the Roxy, then we did Pet Sounds Live, and then I did uh, you know, a bunch of, bunch of studio albums for him. I mean, most notably Smile, and uh, getting over my head, Gershwin, Disney, his Christmas album, Lucky Old Son. My goodness, it's quite a <laughs> start. Start reeling it off. It it uh, reminds it reminds one how long it how long it's been. Because of my involvement with Brian and the Beach Boys, is um, I I wound up uh, doing their first box set. Uh, Good Vibrations in 1993, maybe somewhere in there. And um, uh, the Beach Boys are kind of unique, uh, I think, among bands in that, in that uh, 
they have an awful lot of unreleased material that's of very high quality, which kind of makes sense because even when they were, even in their early albums, um, the album cuts were generally just as, you know, just as good um, as the hits, which was unusual for an act in the 60s. I mean, you know, you made your hits and, you know, you did an album and you had your three or four hits and then a bunch of filler and off it went. But uh, they, they were never really like that. So it's an awful lot of material um, unused, you know, unfinished, unreleased um, uh, material in their archives. And the other great thing about the Beach Boys is that unlike most acts, they always controlled their tapes. Um, and while they didn't, they didn't really care about that any more than anybody else did in the day, because this was all considered to be disposable, you know, once it's gone, it's gone. Um, they didn't turn the tapes into the record label, and the you know record labels, uh, for obvious reasons, aren't going you know aren't going to keep every tape, every outtake. They're going to keep what was necessary to f do the final mix, and the mat then the, of course the, the the final masters, and that's that's it. All the rest of it's going to going to go in the dumpster, and um, uh, so you don't have in a lot in most cases you won't have the sessions, and you won't have all the the run up and with the Beach Boys, especially you know the way Brian produced, where they all produced, it's it, it's so instructive, and uh, that's why we could do projects like the you know the first big one we did was the Pet Sounds Box, where we dissected the entire album, going through the tapes. We we found that we had you know, I think we were missing one tracking session, but we had the subsequent uh, overdub session because the way you, I should explain the way you were recording in those days. Uh, because you only had a limited number of tracks. I mean, in, in 1966, uh, 65, excuse me, there was only one studio, CBS, here in town that had a custom eight-track that they had built, uh, I believe, out of Ampex 354 electronics, meaning you could not record on two adjacent tracks. You had to record on, uh, you know, uh, odd or even tracks. Um, but that was the max you could, you could get, and most people were still just using four-track. So your typical way of doing a pop record. A uh, rock record was you you know record on three track or starting around sixty six you could do four track, um, maybe in mono maybe you spread it out, uh, but then you need more tracks so you're going to mix that down to another another four track and then do your overdubs and in some cases you'd go on and on and on. I at one point was able to uh, listen to an awful lot of Phil Spector masters three track masters and some of those sessions they would go four or five generations. Um, down before the one that, that you would do your final mix uh, from. Because the other thing you would do in those days was if you had one more overdub to do, you wouldn't transfer to another tape. You would just do the overdub while Chuck Britz is doing the mix. So um, like Help Me Rhonda, for example, has a bunch of overdubs that only exist on the mix down. A typical process for the Beach Boys in 64 would have been track is, they truck, cut the track in mono, uh, there generally weren't any overdubs, or if they were, they were very slight. And then, um, well, for let's uh, let's we'll talk about let's talk about "Don't Worry, Baby." So "Don't Worry, Baby" is a mono backing track. It's the band playing. the The remaining two tracks, they did the background vocals first, and then they bounced that to another three track. Combined the ba the uh, the backing vocals, just bounced the track over, and then did the did the lead vocal, and at the same time, Carl did his little guitar solo on the third track, and uh, that's what they mixed to mono. You know, you know Brian's mode was always mono. Um, and while they did issue some of the early albums in stereo, they were, you know, very quick and just with whatever, you know, whatever was left on the final three track. You know, stereo, stereo and pop music was, you know, I mean, in not pop music, and rock music, stereo was, you know, a marketing uh, a thing. I mean, you know, it, it, and I and I I agree. I mean, those records, you know, the original records, <laughs> they were they were they were made to be heard on AM radio, uh, and they were made to be heard in mono, um, and both because of the medium and also you know because in mono, uh, a producer uh, could could make sure that what you were doing was what the listener was going to hear. Stereo, especially in those days, could be so you know, so odd. I mean, you know, speakers behind the couch, speakers out of phase, uh, you know. Um, rock music had always been, been mono. So one advantage we had when we went back to uh, 
do things like the pet sound, pet sounds in stereo is that we could manually sync the first and all, all, all the subsequent, the first reel and all the subsequent overdubs onto at the time what we used was a, a Sony digital dash machine um, to come up with uh, something more like a, like a traditional multi-track master that we could then do a mix from. If you didn't do that, I mean, if, I, if, if you went to the final tape that was used for the original mix, which was in mono, what you had was the entire backing track on one track and then the vocals on a few other tracks. So you really couldn't do much of a stereo mix um, from those tapes. When you're trying to take a, a, um, a record specifically made to be in mono and, and make, a, make stereo out of it with what's left, I mean, you wind up with the band on one side and the vocals on the other side, maybe the lead vocal in the middle. I mean, it's, 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 it's not terribly satisfying. When we were doing the Pet Sounds box, we of course are doing the stereo mix and the song Caroline No, which is, um, there's no backgrounds, but it's a double lead vocal by Brian. And he, 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 he sang the double as it was being mixed. But amazingly, there was a tape in the vaults. Uh, maybe it was an echo delay tape. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a quarter inch. And what's, what's on it is Brian's double. So I was able to take that and manually sync it to the other one. And voila, we have, we have the double vocal. This sort of leads to this, you know, a discussion about the Pet Sound stereo mix, because while it is, you know, 90%, let's say, uh, uh, the same, uh, has the same content as the mono mix, there are a few instances like that where either a double lead isn't on the multitracks or in a couple of cases, most notably, wouldn't it be nice? And God only knows, where on part of the song, the lead vocal that's in the final mix isn't there, having been, I mean, uh, uh, and wouldn't it be nice? I don't know whether Mike originally sang the whole song or only sang the bridge, which is what he's on in the in the finished version. But the A track master uh, has Brian singing the lead all the way through. We eventually used digital extraction technology to try to pull Mike out of the mono mix and add that to the, the new stereo mix. And then there are a couple more like that where um, uh, after something was recorded, Brian apparently decided to go back to an earlier version and use part of it or use all of it. Um, and so the multi-track doesn't, you know, doesn't, doesn't uh, duplicate that. Then, of course, there are things on the multi-track that didn't get used in the in the final mix as well. So the biggest project was uh, we, we, we did a, I think it's a five CD uh, plus LP version of, of the, uh, the Beach Boys Smile recordings, which was very instructive because it was you know, a project that, that Brian labored over for a long time and ultimately had to abandon. And one of the reasons I think he had to abandon it is that the technology was not, uh, yeah, and he wasn't going to catch up to him for another 20, you know, 20, 30 years. He was trying to make a, 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 a record uh, the way you make a film uh, by editing, which he had done with incredible success with good vibrations. But um, the work, the way he was trying to do the, the Smile album was taking that to the next level. And uh, um, the only reason we were able to do it was by the time we got to it, we had everything transferred to digital. We had random access editing, and we had a database that we could instantly access and find where any particular you know piece of anything was and get to it very quickly and you know um, try and edit and redo and edit. I mean, you know, in the old days, uh, believe me, when I was doing the Pet Sounds box, I mean, it was still uh, editing the sessions with you know quarter inch tape and a razor blade. Um, so something that, you know, at that, at that point in time would have taken several hours to edit a, 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 a tracking session uh, down to something you could listen to in, you know, three to five minutes, uh, you know, you, you can do that now in just about the same amount of time in about an hour, an you know, hour and a half. And it's great because, you know, the, 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 the method doesn't get in the way of the creativity the way it used to. So we've been we've been doing these kind of compilations uh, for the band for a long time, but a few years ago, um, or back in 2010 or 11, somewhere in there, uh, in the UK, they came they came out with a new copyright law, which said that anything that had been recorded um, had to be released within 50 years of its 
creation or it became public domain. Um, and the Beach Boys had a kind of a unique problem in that somewhere in the late 70s or uh, very early 80s, somebody got into the hen house and um, copied and made mixes of practically the whole catalog up until about 1970 and released a huge series of bootlegs. So the problem became that these things were already out there. And if we didn't do legitimate legal releases, they were going to fall into public domain. So starting in 2013, I think it was, we started um, doing releases, mostly uh, as online only, uh, um, covering it, you know, covering every year. Uh, the exception being uh, last year, uh, we, we did a, a, seed, a physical release um, um, uh, of the Wild Honey uh, Smiley Smile period, 1967. Uh, as a two CD set, a vinyl, uh, a vinyl set, which also featured the first uh, true stereo mix of the Wild Honey album, an album that had only ever been released in mono up to that point. Um, and then subsequent, uh, we did another volume uh, online only of uh, that sort of material, and then all the live recordings from 1967, which brings us to 2018, uh, where we did the same thing um, for the Friends 2020 and Live in London albums, um, and what would have been an equivalent of a two CD set on the studio albums, and an additional uh, eight concerts, all of which uh, are, uh, are available on, uh, online, either as streaming or uh, as downloads. And uh, yeah, having done this in 2018, we are, we are confident that we'll, well, we pretty much have to keep doing these things because there's an awful lot of uh, material uh, going forward. As I said, this band, I've always said this band left more good stuff behind than most people were, you know, released at all, but uh, which makes them kind of unique. Um, and the nice thing about it is that while we, we do have a lot of stuff, you know, that, that uh, has to be released to just maintain the copyright, at the same time, uh, my partner Alan, Alan Boyd and I have always uh, wanted to do the kind of alternate dissection of, of uh, the records um, that we've been doing since the Pet Sound sessions because it's so instructive. Um, and the Beach Boys, I think the Beach Boys are kind of unique in, in that. Uh, because the making of the records was always um, so interesting. And um, I guess because they were a vocal harmony group, uh, the, way, the way the tracks and the harmonies you know, fit together, unless you take them apart, it's, it, it, it's, uh, it's tough to see exactly how, uh, how amazing uh, it is, how that stuff all fits together. Because we've done all this archive work, we are we are aware of what we of all the tapes we have and all the tapes um, well the few tapes that we don't have. Uh, one of the big holes in the in the tape library was from the Shutdown Volume Two album, and I can't remember now when it was. It's it's got to be a, a good number of years ago. Um, somebody got in contact with us and told us that he had three half inch uh, three track tapes of the Beach Boys. Um, and they turned out to be outtakes um, from the Shutdown Volume 2 album, including the full tracking session for Why Do Fools Fall in Love. And the story he told was that somewhere around 1966, 67, his, his brother, um, who I think has since passed away, came home one day with these three tapes. Uh, it was never really clear where, you know, where they had come from. And uh, the guy we bought them from... Um, had tried over the years to contact management or you know but he didn't he really know didn't know where to go so it had never succeeded what ultimately happened was um that somebody had you know now we're in the online age of course and uh, somebody had written a, a a book about dennis and this this guy with the tapes got in touch with him and he got in touch with us and uh, we had a we had a project uh we were doing for capital at the time uh, that fit perfectly with having these. So Capital agreed to buy the tapes and we were able to use them as part of the project. It was great because that, that's a, you know, that's a really important album. I mean, Fun, Fun, Fun and I Get Around and Might Have Fools Fall in Love and a bunch of other, you know, lesser known tracks. The holy grail that we're missing, well, two things. Some of the smile tapes are missing that we, I mean, that we know existed. There may be more that we just don't know about. And unfortunately, the A-Track Master for Good Vibrations um, was apparently destroyed 
um, when the CBS tape library uh, or the studio, uh, and they just they just cleaned it all out in around 1979, I've been told, um, and destroyed everybody's masters of their own. And, you know, I mean, you know, sadly, as I said, all this stuff was considered, you know, <laughs> uh, a waste of space. Uh, for a long, long, long time, and there are many, many stories about tape, you know, tape libraries just getting, you know, just getting tossed because no, you know, nobody, nobody thought uh, anybody would want it. Um, in fact, the most recent example I can tell you is, is about ten years ago. Uh, somebody came to me and said that they had uh, in a studio called Valentine Recording out in North Hollywood, where the Beach Boys did a fair amount of recording in, in 1968. Um, it was. It had, been, it had been designed by Bill Putnam, so it was kind of a good alternative to Western and so forth. And they recorded uh, some of the stuff on 2020, uh, the, the song Breakaway, um, the original backing track for Do It Again. Somebody had been in there. The, the, when the owner died, the studio was just mothballed. I mean, uh, I eventually got to go in there, and it was literally like, you know, they just kind of turned the lights off and locked the door. Um, and this, the guy who had been in there first went in the tape library and there was a beat there was a one inch tape said beach boys so i got to go in there and see what it was and it turned out to be three different versions of a song called all i want to do from the 2020 album so from 1968 so that's one of the things we featured on the on the new set so these things are out and uh, these things are out there oh yeah and there's another example about 15 years ago somebody came to us with a like 25 tapes um, and looking at them, we realized that they were, they filled in a gap of tapes that we, some of which we knew and some of which we didn't, but uh, we, we, that had been stolen around 1980, 81. So uh, I wound up having to buy those back and it was the sessions for fun, fun, fun. And I get around and um, some stuff from the first album, multi-tracks and some of the live in London tapes, some of the Christmas album tapes. It was really kind of random. Some things we didn't know existed, like the first generation uh, mix reel for the Smiley Smile album, which they then copied again because they needed to add fades and do some edits. And you know, sonically, it's it's a million miles above what uh, we've had to use as a master, you know, uh, for nearly 60 years. Discovering these tapes is great because, well, first of all, some of, some of these are versions and, and songs that we didn't know existed. And then as far as getting the masters back, um, you know, we're able to, uh, to do true stereo mixes the way we, we did in for Pet Sounds. And, but again, also, it's, it's being able to hear the process because what we wound up with was, you know, we wound up with outtakes. And the other advantage in the early days is that when you're doing vocals that way, you're now running two machines. So... The second machine where you're doing the vocals, you're going to do multiple takes and you're going to have talking and, you know, so again, you, you get to hear the process. When you get to, to a track, you're not doing that anymore. You're, you're doing your vocal and if you don't like it, you're erasing it and doing it again. One thing we, we do know is that early on for Good Vibrations, because we have some footage that we recovered filming in the, in the sessions, is that Dennis Wilson was singing the lead with a completely different set of lyrics. There were early lyrics to the song. And we can see that in the film, but um, we've never found even a rough mix. Going back to Good Vibrations, and uh, you know, it's, it, it's certainly one of the biggest, if not the biggest uh, recording by the group. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate that we don't have the, we don't have the final A track with, with all the vocals. Um, we have all the tracking sessions in, in a better three track, and we have a uh, a track that, uh, among other things, contains a copy of the edited four track uh, master before it was transferred to a track at CBS. So many years ago, I, I <laughs> it was quite a project because um, the number of Good Vibrations uh, uh, session tapes, uh, backing tracks, is about that tall, uh, maybe three or four feet tall, three track. Um, so figuring out where each section came from was a bit of a, a job, but we did that, put it all together, and now we had a stereo backing track. And there are a few little pieces of vocals on that four track, along with the overdub cello, cellos, and the overdub theremin. So we've got a pretty good start. Um, and at, yeah, and and in the last ten years or so, as digital extraction technology has gotten better, 
we have experimented with that song and with a few others using um, extraction techniques to uh, try to get the vocals that we can add to our stereo backing track. And uh, we, we, we have been using a company out of Ireland called Audio Source RE, um, who are presenting, uh, I know, at NAMM uh, this year. And um, they have got, I mean, I've, I've tried a few of these different programs, and they've got the best one I, I've heard so far under the right conditions. You really can <laughs> can isolate, uh, I've only really tried to isolate vocals, but you can, you can certainly do that. Um, and one of the things on my on, on my to do list is uh, to 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 uh, go through the vocal process again and uh, you know update the mix and uh, hope, hopefully uh, release it. I mean I you know I've known realized for years at some point uh, yeah I'm sure we'll be able to take any recording and um, extract anything that'll be good for us. That's all for now. If you liked what you saw, be sure to like, share and subscribe and click the bell so you know when we upload new films. Be sure to visit soundonsound.com and our Instagram page as well. Thanks for watching.